Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 28th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I'm your host, Steve Patterson, and today I've got an interview for you on Christian theology. As with any topic, I always like to start with the basics. So with Christianity, one of those basic questions is, who is Jesus in the first place? Who or what is God? What is the relationship between God and human beings? How was Jesus different, if at all, from regular human beings? Does Christianity necessarily imply dualism? And one of the questions that came up I really enjoyed in this interview is, what is a who? And there's this funny exchange about half an hour in where the English language starts breaking down a bit, where we start talking about the difference between who and what. But though it sounds funny, the concepts are actually really deep and insightful. As I think I've said before on the show, I treat all claims as philosophic claims. It doesn't matter if they're religious claims, astrological claims, claims in physics, claims in philosophy. In my perspective, pretty much everything is philosophy. And I also think it's kind of a tragedy that religious claims that have been around for thousands of years are so readily mocked by the intelligentsia. I want to give a platform for anybody to say anything that they like, as long as it's logically coherent. And we can use our reason and rational analysis to see if we find the arguments persuasive or not. So I, as somebody who's you know, a passionate rationalist, I have nothing to fear from examining religious concepts. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good, and I think, especially by judging some of the feedback I've gotten from you guys on the show, I think you guys really appreciate me trying to give an intellectually honest platform for people to talk about different religious ideas. This is something that I certainly didn't get much when I was in undergrad. I know a lot of people didn't. The general assumption on campus was, if you're not a scientific materialist, then you are superstitious, and if you have any religious belief, well, then you might be irrational or even insane. And speaking of unfortunate experiences in college, the sponsor for the show is a company called Praxis. If Praxis existed while I was in college, I most likely would have taken at least a gap year to see what the program was about because they specialize in taking young, enthusiastic individuals who are either stuck in college or who want to avoid college altogether and placing them into the real world. Praxis is a nine-month program that's three months of professional boot camp where you learn actual real-world skills that will help you when you get out of college, and it's followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship. And after you complete the program, they contractually guarantee you a $40,000 a year job offer. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in, go to discoverpraxis.com. And on their homepage, they have a button that says Schedule a Call. Click it, set up an appointment, and see if it's right for you. Now, returning back to Christian theology, I spoke with Dr. Ian McFarland, who is the Regius Professor of Divinity at the University of Cambridge. And one of his main focuses in theology is called Christology, which, as you can imagine, is specifically about the central figure in Christianity, Jesus. So if you want to listen to how a professional theologian thinks about these things, you're going to love this interview. So first of all, thank you very much, Dr. McFarland, for sitting down and speaking with me today. You're very welcome. So I have uh, a lot of questions for you because in my background, I come from an evangelical household, very uh, conservative evangelical household. And I grew up and I did, wasn't a big fan of Christianity. Um, I, I kind of felt like I was indoctrinated. I felt like a lot of the ideas were vacuous. They weren't very clearly articulated. And so I'm hoping in this series that I can be talking to intellectuals who have some kind of religious belief, whether it's in Christianity or it's in Buddhism or Hinduism, and try to really dive into like the philosophy of religion. Because I think I'm very persuaded by a lot of the things that Jesus Christ had to say. While I think it's profound uh, moral truths, I, you know, it's obviously changed the world, big deal. However, a lot of those moral truths are coupled with metaphysical claims. Like, okay, here's this great guy, he's got these great ideas, and then Christians say, oh, but there's more. This guy is, is God incarnate, he's come to earth, and then they add on a lot of metaphysical baggage. Now, I don't want to dismiss the, all that, that metaphysics, so I'm hoping that today we can kind of dive into it and see if there's some plausibility there. So the first question, I guess, is, in your own uh, personal worldview, and based on the research that you've done, what is or who is Jesus Christ? Is it a person, a human being just like you and me who had really good ideas? Is it a, is it a grand metaphor? Is it literally God who, 
who came to earth and is now, you know, now walked among us. What is your belief on that? Well, Jesus is a human being just like you and me, which is a very traditional Christian belief, and he is God among us, which is also a very traditional belief. <laughs> so uh, both, um, and that's been the, uh, the majority position of Christians since, well, I mean, some might argue implicitly from very, very early on, but explicitly since the fifth century, that Jesus is one person, um, uh, the Son of God, the Word, eternal Word, uh, who is made flesh and thus is uh, in two natures. And it's really that um, distinction between nature and person that uh, provides, I would argue, the coherent metaphysical framework for that traditional Christian claim. Okay, so let's dive into that a, a bit. So the claim is that at the same time, Jesus is 100% a human, like you and me, and also the is also God, but what does that mean? Is, is the creator of the universe, is, what is it, what are you, when you say he's also God, what is that? Yeah, God is the creator of the universe, the uh, source of all being. Um, in fact, that's, I mean, I think if you look historically, beginning very early by the end of the second century, the, the claims for divinity of Jesus, which you get from both early Christian and pagan sources refor reporting on Christianity, is that uh, Jesus was regarded by Christians as God. And the logic behind it is, um, if you confess Jesus as Savior, that is the one who can guarantee the integrity of human, and for that matter, any creature's existence against any possible threat, the only being who can have that capacity is God. So to, to claim that Jesus is Savior and not claim that Jesus is God is to engage in, a, in a, a incoherence. Uh, uh, that, that which is less than God always has at least one other reality, namely God, that could block uh, that being's ability to fulfill the promises that, 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 is, that are made. So uh, the confession of Jesus as God, is that, that is quite clearly quite early, and I'd argue that its origins are soteriological. Uh, so what, rooted, is that, what does that term mean? That rooted in, the, in Christian convictions about uh, the capacity of Jesus to save. So on the basis of the confession that Jesus saves, um, it, the inference is drawn that Jesus is God. And then the, then the challenge becomes, well, how can you say that and still uh, confess the one God of Israel and uh, not um, follow a follow of the first commandment uh, and so on and so forth. So when you say Jesus saves, what does that mean? Because I've heard that a lot in my lifetime growing up. Jesus, I've seen it on the billboards too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were saying you're from, uh, you spend a lot of time in Atlanta, and if you drive through some of the highways there, you'll see the words Jesus saves and big billboard. So what, what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, it means uh, saving uh, in uh, Abrahamic uh, religions uh, refers to the, again, sort of the, I mean, you know, not, you know gold, gold line streets and pearly gates. I mean, what it means is that the, the, uh, every threat that uh, confronts human existence is defeated by God. So they, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, a confession that's common to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that God, is, God saves. Christians also believe that God saves, but they believe that God saves in Jesus. And insofar as they're willing to say that um, Jesus is rightly the immediate object of that trust, then it follows that Jesus has to be confessed as equal to God and therefore as God. So that when you're shaking Jesus' hand, you're shaking God's hand, which needless to say neither Jews or Muslims would claim even though Muslims, unlike Jews, would say Jesus is God's word, but they just don't see um, that as having the same um, metaphysical implications that Christians do. So this is interesting when you, when you say that, that Jesus saves means it's overcoming all of these human obstacles, these things that we worry about, Jesus. Well, human obstacles, but I mean, our, our own sin and things of that sort, but also extrinsic things. Right, uh, that, that's the, that part when you were saying that made me think, I think, oh, well, what about death? I mean, yeah. if, if Jesus saves from all these, all these things, isn't death part of that? But then my, my evangelical upbringing goes, oh, no, Jesus is supposed to have conquered that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit? So I know, like, in the Bible, it claims that, um, you know, when you die and you're a believer, you're going, there's going to be some kind of a resurrection that happens. Can you explain what that means? Does that mean that... There's a, there's the metaphysical position in Christianity is not physicalism, right? There's you have this physical body and you have this spirit. So when we're talking about, no. is, is that not right? Well, well I, mean, I, mean, I, don't, I mean, 
I think most Christians over time have been metaphysical dualists or anthropological dualists mm -hmm. in some sense, but I don't think there's anything particularly uh, central to that. Um, okay. uh, certainly, you would have a hard time finding a metaphysical dualism in the Old Testament in the same way that you would uh, in Plato. So in the New Testament, there, there, are more. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's a contrast between killing the body and killing the soul. But I think a, a hard, a hard pressed. I mean, I, I wouldn't pin my hat to to dualism. I don't think it's anything. I don't think it's heretical, but I don't find that to be necessarily a sine qua non of Christian thought. So and then, when we're talking about Paul, the resurrection, I think, for example, thinks that when you die, you stay dead until the resurrection. I don't think there's any evidence he believes that there's a soul that lingers anywhere. But for that resurrection, then, and without the dualism, yeah. that would mean physical, literal, physical body resurrection. Well, it means that there's, I don't know, not, not according to Paul, it's a spiritual body, and I don't know what a spiritual body is. <laughs> okay, that's what I wanted to add. Uh, but I, mean, I, think, I think what's key is, um, I mean, because there are, there are um, uh, trichotomous anthropologies in early Christian writers, there are dichotomous yeah. anthropologies. I think the, the key point is, which Christianity shares with Judaism and again uh, Islam, is that uh, human being is in, is somatic; that it that it is it isn't abstractable from uh, from a body. Now, again, when Paul says it's ra it's raised a spiritual body, I'm not I don't know what a spiritual body is. The only bodies I know are material, um, uh, but insofar, uh, uh, but you know, and the. New Testament descriptions of Jesus' resurrection body is, it describes it all kinds of prima facie contradictory characteristics. So I don't really have any great sense of what a spiritual body would be, but I take it that the hope is nevertheless that there is a, uh, that that which makes us, um, that, that, and I think this is important for the ways in which, frankly, a dichotomous anthropology has been damaging uh, over the history of the church, is that there's not a sense in which um, somehow our real selves are underneath or independent of our somatic selves, that uh, uh, who we are uh, is a, a psychosomatic entity. And that's, and at some, in some way, which I have no particular model of in my head, part of what it means to be saved is there's an affirmation of that entirety, although obviously not under the conditions of physical existence because it's maybe new heaven and new earth and all kinds of other things. So, um, but the, but the, to be saved is to be affirmed in one's psychosomatic particularity and not as a soul sort of being rescued from the physical maelstrom. Uh, okay, so if, um, if it's the case that we go down this route, let's take the, the physicalist um, metaphysics here. What would God's existence be if not in the physical body, like prior to Jesus or maybe after Jesus? If he exists and he's a being, but he doesn't have a body, wouldn't that imply necessarily some kind of dualism? Well, no, because uh, God isn't a thing among God is transcendent, and so you don't. Uh, God isn't rangeable among the category. What that means is God is not categorizable, right? The medieval quip "Deus non est in genere." Uh, God isn't. Um, uh, an entity alongside other entities, even if you make the scale, you put him at the, him being a loose term, at the top end of the scale. Uh, God is, I mean, the, 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 I think the most um, attractive, summative uh, way of talking about God's transcendence is Nicholas of Cusa's uh, description of God as not other. Um, uh, okay. which, which is not that God is the same, of course, uh, or it's not pantheism, um, but simply that you that uh, God isn't rightly conceived as an entity alongside other entities. And I think that's really the force also of Anselm's argument in the Proslogion, um, that what he's arguing is not that perfection implies existence, or as uh, Descartes and Kant thought, um, but that if you're thinking of God, as it were, abstractly in the third person, you haven't really grasped who God is. At that point, you thought of God like a black swan or whatever, I mean, something that you can sort of reflect on as an entity alongside other entities, whereas God is only known in as God makes God's self known to one, as it were, in the second person. Interesting, the proslogion is in fact written in the second person, uh, I think, uh, in that respect. So, um, so uh, categories of, I mean, um, we use words of God because we can't talk without using words, but all our words uh, used of God uh, it, to the extent that they're positive descriptions of God, apply to God only analogically. So to speak of God, for example, as spirit, 
um, is not to say that God is spirit as opposed to matter, as though uh, like creaturely spirits and matter are, but simply to, you know, I think in that case, reflecting on God's incorporeality, God's, it's, it, it has a negative function as an attribute. So, uh, and I think incidentally, that's how the incarnation can be made metaphysically coherent, because you're not thinking of God as something, in which case to say that God and, and humanity were in one person would be at best a hybrid, not fully both. So if we say that God's existence is uh, transcendent, does that not imply then that there is some type of existence that is uh, non-physical? Well, except that even existence, I think at that point is being applied analogically. Yeah, some type of existence, but you have to place an awful lot of weight on the some type. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, mean, it, I mean, because I mean, what, what, you, what, what, we, what, when, what I think transcendence, uh, in order to interpret transcendence appropriately, and I think consistently with the way people like Aquinas interpreted it, for example, or for that matter, the Protestant scholastics and Catholic scholastics too, um, it isn't a contrastive category. That's the whole point of the not other in terms of Incusanus's thought. Uh, it's not this as opposed to that. It's asking you to break out of the kinds of categories that that uh, cause you to think of things in terms of this or that in competitive or contrastive terms. This makes me think very much of Eastern ideas that they say things like, you know, words can't uh, describe the Tao, the eternal Tao. If you're talking about it, you're not actually talking about it because it's non-dualism. It's not this versus that. Is there some similarity there? Or is also the Eastern philosophies kind of pointing at the same? Well, I mean, it, I, mean it, it is, I mean, certainly, I mean, Augustine said, you know, if you can understand that it's not God, right? And so it's, 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 it's well established in, in the tradition. I mean, uh, the, I mean, the difference between, I mean, uh, there are lots of differences, I'm sure. An obvious difference with Taoism is that the Tao is not personal. Mm -hmm. um, and the Tao is understood, I think, more like something like the Logos and Heraclitus. I mean, it's an, it's an intra-worldly principle, whereas um, the Abrahamic God is not, is the creator of the world. But isn't that putting a kind of a label and a category on him to say he is Well, yeah, personal? because you can't, because you, you, you can't, I mean, even putting transcendence a category, right? I mean, you can't, you can't <laughs> not do it. The, 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 uh, so, in fact, uh, although there's an impropriety always in speaking of God in the third person, language is language and we're st stuck with it. So the question is, how do you, how are you able to honor that, um, uh, you talk about God that way and insist that all terms are applied analogically without simply making that, I mean, that's really, I think, the objection, modern objections to, to theism since the scientific revolution have said, is that, well, if you're not going to use words univocally, then they have no meaning. Uh, and Christians want to say, well, we can't coherently use words univocally of God because that's unfaithful to the kind, to the kind of entity God is or who God is. Uh, so on what basis then do we control our use of language? I mean, um, uh, some people have talked about analogy is, and its proper use is simply controlled equivocation. How do you do that in a way that is uh, responsible and consistent within the frame with, with, that you're working in? So yeah, do you, do, do you inevitably apply uh, in, in using words? Are you effectively categorizing God? Yeah, sure you are. Are there ways in which you can uh, do that and guard and uh, sort of speak around what you're saying in ways that indicate uh, the trickiness of this. I think there are, and good theologians do it well, and bad theologians commit idolatry, and probably all good theology has bits of idolatry in it because there's ine there are inevitable blind spots to any one person's uh, ways of talking, so that there are certain ways in which they're reifying uh, certain terms or ideas about God are probably invisible and they need somebody else to call them out on it. I mean, most you know, uh, prominently in the contemporary or last 50 years, you know, exclusively male language for God and things of that sort, which you know, was unproblematic for a long, long time until people said, well, wait a minute, actually that has a whole bunch of implications you haven't taken account of, so. So we can't necessarily reference God uh, because that implies putting boundaries around him, that somehow it's God in contrast to something else. But when bringing it back to Jesus, at that point, we're saying he's God. We can kind of put boundaries around him, right? What I would say is this. You can identify God. You can't define God. You can identify. So what is the nature of that identification? Is it just like a silent understanding? No. It's about saying this is who God is. 
um, uh, it's a who question rather than a what question. So, a who uh, question. Um, I mean, again, do I can I use what words about God? Sure, I'll say that God is good and one and Trinity and various other things. But uh, but none of those are properly speaking definitional. The essence of God, Christians claim, is ineffable. Um, but God is the one who called Abraham and brought the Israelites out of Egypt and became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. I see. So um, in terms of the metaphysics of the incarnation, um, uh, God's, I mean, Christians claim, and uh, in this they'd be, in fact, there was a lot of interaction between Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the Middle Ages just on these points. Um, God, when we say God creates, um, we're not simply, in fact, we're not even primarily uh, talking about an originary of, originating event. We're talking about a relation, right? All things have their being insofar as God gives them being, and all things have being only insofar as God gives them being at every point of their existence. So that's the doctrine of creation from nothing, which is Maimonides, uh, the great uh, medieval Jewish uh, theologian philosopher, felt was the one thing that one doctrine that Christians, Jews, and Muslims held in common. Um, so uh, that means that God is the sole antecedent condition of every creature's existence at every moment of its existence. Um, so how does Jesus differ from you or me? Right. Uh, not in the sense that God is any more present in him quantitatively, because God's already maximally present everywhere hmm. uh, as creator. Um, the difference is, uh, whereas, and so at one level we can say God is the cause of everything that I do, in the same way sort of that Shakespeare is the cause of everything that Macbeth does, right? But Shakespeare is not Macbeth. Uh, the difference with Jesus is that in this one case, this one creature, God relates to this creature in such a way as to say, I, this, this, creature, this creature's life is mine. But so there is, so, is there so, so Jesus is, is objectively, you cut him open, do anything you want to him, it's, it's human, but his identity, the who, the what remains, the divine what is ineffable, invisible, you know, all the things that Christians have say of God. But who Jesus is, is God. So let's go back to the, uh, the Shakespeare Macbeth analogy. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, are you claiming that he, regular humans, non-Jesus non humans. Non-Jesus humans, yeah. <laughs> that we are essentially characters in, uh, in the God novel? Well, it's, 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 an, it's an analogy, but the analogy, the, what I'm trying to suggest by, what, what the, I think the analogy, when the analogy isn't original with me, I mean, Austin Farrer used it, other people have used it. Um, the analogy is helpful in that it talks about how you can have God be the immediate cause of all things and the one on whom all creatures depend on all, in all respects at all times while still giving some integrity to creaturely activity. So when you're at, I mean, here's where the analogy I think has some cash value. So if I ask you, um, um, uh, why does Shakespeare, uh, uh, why does Shakespeare, why does Macbeth kill Duncan? You can give me two kinds of answers, right? You can say because Shakespeare meant him to, and that's perfectly okay, but it will not get you a good grade in an English class. <laughs> or you can talk about, you know, his relationship with his wife and his, you know, the theory of the witches and his own sense of ambition and da 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 da. And that's a perfectly, that's the kind of English, that's an English class helpful answer, right? They're both, both answers are correct at a different level of explanation, right? This is the old primary secondary cause distinction. So similarly, uh, why is it that I'm talking to you right now? Well, because God's, making me talk to you right now uh, at the level of primary cause. But uh, that's, and that's true of everything that's happening everywhere, but it's a pretty vacuous explanation in terms of anything that you'd be actually interested in. You, you know, why am I talking to you right now? Well, because you asked me and I try to be a nice fellow and I want to be interested in making people know my ideas if they're interested in them and various other things, right? So, uh, so are we like, and uh, uh, are we like characters or not? Well, yeah, we're like them in the sense that uh, our existence depends entirely on God, and God is the one who gives that existence. And why does God give that existence? Well, Christians want to say because God wishes to share God's being. And I guess talking, I'm not a novelist, but talking to people who write plays and novels, they have sort of a sense that this is a, you know, they have a, 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 a neat, a neat, a neat uh, scenario they want to put forward, and they do it. And that's basically the Christian and, again, Jewish and Muslim explanation of creation. It's not necessary to God. It's a free donation of being to that which otherwise would have no being, even as, well, Macbeth is a quasi-historical figure, but even as, you know, David Copperfield would have no existence if Dickens hadn't decided to give it to him. So the natural question um, comes up, does this not kind of necessarily imply that there would be no free will 
in this worldview? No, because uh, free will is a creaturely category, and uh, God creates a world that has a variety of different kinds of causes in it, some of which are nat mechanical, if you want to put it that way, natural law, some of which are free, human beings, angels, extraterrestrials maybe, who knows, some of which are random, if certain interpretations of quantum mechanics are correct, even as if you look at a novel, uh, some things happen because you know rocks fall on people's heads and they get and they bleed and die or whatever. Uh, some things happen because the characters do them on their own but because they're of not their free will. They're not actually doing. Well, it's they all, are. I mean, they, well, in, in, the, in, the, in the world of the novel, they certainly are. I mean, you would not. You, you, you would not. I mean, again, it would be kind of a weird reading of a novel to say that again everything simply happens because the the, the, the novelist says so. You can do that, but it doesn't, I mean, it would be kind of odd to say, to, to, to conflate various kinds of causal mechanisms that are described as all really being, as not being different, when in fact, they're, you read them as being quite different. And similarly, uh, uh, to think of um, God's relationship to the world, what God creates are ranges of different causes, in, among which are the free causes of creatures. Now are the free causes of creatures, are the free actions of creatures within God's will? Yeah, they are. But the point is, again, because God isn't simply a big white man with a beard in the sky, uh, but God, um, it's the transcendent origin and cause of all that is, God is capable of bringing forth free causes as, a, as God can bring forth mechanical causes. And I think it's, I want to make a sure. sidelight side here. Um, I think uh, there's something odd to me and I think it re 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 reflects a, a bad sense of analogy to think that somehow it's very straightforward to think of God creating a world in which mechanical causes happen, but it's somehow very odd to think of God creating a world in which things can be genuinely free. As though there's something less mysterious about why there should be gravity or electromagnetism than free decision. Uh, I mean, the world is not a Rube Goldberg machine, right? Uh, God's relationship to natural causes, physical laws, is no less mysterious and I, I would think no more obvious or self-evident than God's relationship to free causes. I mean, I think what the problem is, we tend to think of God making the sun go around the, or getting the earth go around the sun as like us putting a satellite into orbit, but it's not. God's not manipulating levers. God is putting the whole thing into being. Uh, and within that, the various kinds of causal processes that are part of creation, um, and the three that I've uh, identified are pretty classical, chance, um, uh, freedom, and natural causation, necessity, effectively. Well, all of those are relative to creation. Nothing is necessary or free or random with respect to God, if you want to put it that way, even as, again, the novel is all the novelist's mm -hmm. work. But within the novel, that's the way the novel works. Within the world, that's the way it works. You're not, I mean, are you really free? Is that what you're asking? Well, if, are you really free relative to God? It's a bit of an odd question because freedom is a category of creation uh, and God isn't part of creation. Are you really free relative to the camera or your parents or whatever? Yeah, you are. As, as, as much as free means anything, that's what it means. It, it, returning to the, uh, the author-character sure. relationship, on the one hand, we could say, yes, fictional characters, could they have chosen otherwise than they do in their, than, in their novels? Well, kind of, but that's, that's, like a, that's a superficial metaphysical level. I mean, like, ultimately. Like the, the you know, Harry Potter, right, since we're, we're not that far away from, uh, from Harry Potter land here. Uh, couldn't really have made different decisions, right? I mean, if, uh, if, you're, if you're kind of in the novel, it's like, okay, yes, you, you act as if it's the case, and the characters all interact as if it's the case, but ultimately, he's not even responsible for anything. He's just, he's fiction. And, th and it seems like that's, this is kind of a similar worldview in the sense that God is the ultimate author and origin of everything, and he, from, from w one perspective, it appears for all practical purposes that there's a freedom, but in the sense there is this... What, what perspective are you adopting where there's not freedom? The same perspective where I would say there's no freedom in a novel for characters to choose otherwise. We, we play as if there is, but well, there is, I mean, even the part, thought processes... Yeah, but partly that's it. because you're... I mean, and this is where the analogy obviously breaks down to an extent. You can imagine yourself, you, you can imagine yourself as an author. You can make up stuff and you, you, know, you can sort of say... I mean, I, I think it is interesting, although, that authors generally 
tend to have the view, at least when I talk to them, that they're not simply f arbitrarily free to do what they want with their characters, that characters actually, there's an integrity to characters that part of the creative process yes, but, is to honor. But however, but that's, however, that's, yeah. 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 Um, but the point is you can't, there's no imagining yourself in the place of God, uh, which is the only perspective from which that would make sense. Uh, because to imagine yourself in the place of God is automatically to have mistaken who God is, which is namely not you, <laughs> or me, or anybody else. So I, I uh, so yeah, I mean the, the analogy, uh, I mean it breaks down a lot of ways. I mean God creates from nothing, novelists create based on, you know, by appropriating materials, right. intellect we already have. But that's precisely the point. I mean God creates from nothing, which means even, I mean to sort of push it, the whole idea of possible worlds, I think from, I mean we can talk about that, but that makes no sense from God doesn't choose among possible worlds to create. Rather, God's creation is precisely that in which there is such a thing as the actualization of possibilities. But it can't be scaled up to God without bringing God down effectively to our set. So the uh, our our set of circumstances. So the novel character is designed to be suggestive. Um, or the novel analogy is designed to be suggestive of the fact that there we can hear here's a place where you can see two different levels of operation where there is a set of claims one makes that are coherent and meaningful at one level and there's another level at which they are relativized radically and yeah I want to say that Christian I mean that, that human freedom and physical laws and quantum randomness or whatever other causal processes human beings may uncover are, with respect to God, radically relativized. Yeah, they're all a product of God's gift. Uh, they're all dependent always. Our, my freedom, even as my blood, non-free pumping of my heart's uh, blood through my body, uh, are all int intimately dependent at every moment of their activities on God. Nevertheless, freedom is not the same as, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that freedom reduces to physical cause. It means that there's God creates physical causes and God creates free causes. Both of them are dependent on God, but they're different kinds of causes. Okay, so let's let's return back to the um, Jesus metaphysics because yeah. this is the thing that I really have I have a hard time wrapping my head around. Sure. We say that. So do I. <laughs> it's not an easy it's not an easy uh, issue. So the claim is that Jesus was. 100% like us in terms of being human. So the, the question I have is, do humans have the same uh, capacity as uh, Jesus did for this, this unique relationship with God? Or are we, is he, it doesn't that, and if we don't, does that not imply that there's a different metaphysical essence to? It has nothing to do with capacity. Jesus being God isn't about a capacity. It's about who he is. You're being Steve isn't a capacity you have, it's who you are. My being Ian isn't a capacity, it's who I am. Now, none of I, us... I could end up getting Alzheimer's. I would, have, I would lose a lot of capacities. It wouldn't change my identity. So then there's no way... Because I know a lot of Christians talk about, um, like, you have God inside of you. When you become a Christian, you're supposed to have Jesus or, and or God inside of you. So yeah, the spirit inside, inside of you. you. Which Jesus did as a human being. But that isn't what made him that, I mean, uh, Jesus does, as we all do, uh, faithful things by virtue of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, that's what made Jesus humanly able to do miracles, for example, um, okay, but, so and to do his teaching. But that's, and that's the, same, that's the same as you and me. But that isn't what, that, that is part of what his vocation was as the person he was, I'm getting tangled here, the Son of God. Uh, that, doesn't, that isn't what made him the Son of God. That's what. That's part of his humanity. Okay. So that. So that. So, from the beginning, then the person of Jesus wasn't just like us, and then he kind of became God, or here. No, no, he was God was, from the he was from God conception. Yeah. From the very beginning. Yeah. Now. He was God, in addition, to being just like us. Well, and only in the sense uh, you can use that language if you want to say you're you're Stephen in addition to being like other human beings, if you think it, but I, I would not, I want to say that who is a, is a, is a, uh, is a, is a, is a um, ontologically different kind of question than what? Who is an ontologically different kind of question than what? Yeah. Okay. And that, that still strikes me as a, as a very dualist uh, idea. No, because right? it has nothing to do with soul. Jesus, Jesus had a human soul and the soul is not your identity. 
Your soul is part of it if you want to talk about, and again, I have no, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not deeply committed to du dualistic anthropology, but I mean, this is a classic Christian point. Jesus had a human body and a human soul, but he was the divine person. Well, so when you use the term who, what are you referencing? Because when I think of who, I, I maybe I'm thinking of what. Yeah, well, that may be what you are doing. And in fact, I noticed, I, I wrote an article on this last year, and uh, one of my, one of the editors at the journal said, you know, I think here you've actually talked about a who is though or what. I said, oh, you're right, so I changed the language. <laughs> um, now, who, I mean, and, and, but it's, it's a crucial distinction. So I mean, you, you're, you're right to raise, the, to raise the concern. Who is just that? It's who, it's the, it's the identity of the person. Um, uh, and but, who okay, is something well, and only person. What is the identity though? <laughs> it, like, it's, what is it's, the it's, it's purely deictic. It's, it's, this, it's, it's this one. Is there a metaphysical essence to the who? That's what it is. It's the who. That's there's no. If, well, if you make it essence, then you're talking about what. So here's. I mean, the the, <laughs> right. the, the um, so in the Trinity, right, or the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, what are Christians claiming with that? They're saying there's only one God, and uh, this God uh, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if you say, well, what, what is a per what is a person exactly? Well, then you're breaking it down because, of course, what Christians want to say is all the attributes of God, wisdom, goodness, holiness, glory, eternity, whatever you want to bring up, uh, all of those are equally shared by all the persons. So who-ness isn't an attribute because if it were, then, you'd, then you would no longer have one God. You'd have three gods, right? Well, who-ness isn't an attribute, but, but when we say... so. It's purely, it's purely deictic. It's purely indexical. You point to someone. I mean, Richard of St. Victor but defined the person as an incommunicable essence of the divine nature, which as far as I can see is a fancy way of saying it's something that can't be defined. But when you're pointing at something, you're, st you're still pointing at yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, and this There's is the problem. So, well, so, so I'm pointing yeah. at you. I'm pointing at a bunch of skin and blood and bones and hair and eyes. Um, and yet, I'm, so I'm pointing at only what? And in fact, what you see of Jesus in terms of what's, 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 what, are the, what are the photons bouncing off of, it's all what? It's all created substance. So what do I, and so here's where, we, here's where my dualism gets problematic and where I go with Wittgenstein and Gilbert Ryle over Descartes. I don't infer, however, a who underneath all that somewhere in your pineal gland or whatever, right? Uh, the who is the one, is the one who, who, is mediated through this stuff, yes. but is not identical with the stuff. Yeah, I can, agree, yeah. I can agree with all that, but does that, if it's the case that the who exists, right? Uh, the who is the one who is you. Um, to say it, I mean, there's no hypothesis apart from its instantiation in a nature. So there's something, so, but, 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 but the hypothesis isn't, a, isn't an attribute in the way that any other, in the way that other, it isn't an accident. So when we reference somebody like Harry Potter, right? Yeah. There's a, there's a who kind of, but the, yeah, but the, who, who, but yeah, the who doesn't, the who doesn't have a different essence than a you and I who. <laughs> no, it's not, no, 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 exactly. Because we're, we're the same, I mean, assuming Harry Potter is a, is, a, is a human boy or young man or whatever, however old he is by now. Um, uh, yeah, we have, we, we share a common essence, but we are, we are differentiated as distinct who's. But we're both we're all human beings. Yes, but your who? This is this yeah. is turning English into a very funny sounding. No, no, language. Well, yeah. Your who is different than my who. <laughs> exactly. Okay, okay. Very, very, exactly. And, and we have different but, hypostatic properties. I mean, you're you know, you're maybe I don't know. You're a little taller than me. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. But like however, that. your who and my who are different. I agree with that. Yeah. But they share some quality that Harry Potter's who does not. Well, yeah. Harry Potter. Harry Potter isn't a real person. Yeah. But yeah, okay, so, but, so you're using but, who, but, so, if you're talking about fictional characters, the who's analogical. I mean, there's no, I can't murder Harry Potter. But, but, what, I'm, but that, <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying is there is a metaphysical essence to a who. There has to be, because if we can reference Harry Potter as a who, but he doesn't have that essence, and you and I actually have the essences. Well, Harry Potter be. doesn't have a human nature. So there's, so, so he there's, doesn't so have a what. what. He doesn't have a exactly. what. He doesn't have a so, yeah, I'm happy to say all who's are instantiated as what's. There's no free-floating who. A who is always a particular, a kind of who. It's you know, but, it's Gabriel, about the God? angel who, or but God is a who, right? God is three who's, in fact, or yeah, three hypotheses. But but, uh, but only one what, which is different. <laughs> but I, th I don't I want to get you, into that. I thought you, trying to, yeah, go ahead. I thought you implied before that that God doesn't really have a what, because that implies. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, to talk about divine nature, you got to put it in quotes. Yeah. 
Okay. And in fact, and I think that's one thing that's is, I think that's important is that I, I would want to. Oh, this is getting going to get us way would get us way off. But just put it as a parenthetical mm -hmm. comment. Uh, I think that we are who's only insofar as God addresses us as who's. That well, is, well, we're, we're treated as we are. We are. We are treated as persons by God, and that's the that's how we become. So not simply because a who isn't simply an individual. This is an individual instance of a chair. It's not a who. Right. Right. This is still about metaphysics, which is what I want to talk about. So sure, I do want sure. to ex explore this. So what, here's my own personal worldview: that the chair is has a. So what we're, what we reference when we say chair hmm. is bits of matter that are arranged in a particular way that we call a chair. There's no fundamental chairness that's out there that's substantiated. It's just really a concept. It doesn't mean that the bits of matter don't exist, but the chair is just a concept. That seems to be different than when we're talking about beings. There seems to be something else there. So what I would say is if there were no minds, there would be no chairs. You'd still have bits of matter, you wouldn't have chairs. If there were no minds, there were no conceptual identification of things, you would still have people, you would still have beings, right? Uh, yeah, you would have individual human entities, yeah. Right, so and for me, I, I have that belief and I don't know how not to couple that with the metaphysical dualism and say, well, therefore it must be. Well, I, I want to distinguish metaphysical dualism. I mean, I'm not, again, if, if, if I, I'm not, I, I think uh, body-soul anthropology is theologically adiaphora. There's nothing wrong with it. A lot of Christians have held it, and there have been very different ways to do it. You can do it platonically, hylomorphism. You can do it more platonically, so on and so forth. But what I want to, what I want to emphasize is that soul is not who. Soul, if soul is part of your what, that is, human beings are made of body and soul, then that's part of your what. The who uh, strikes me as a name, then. If we're saying yeah, the who it's, is it's not what. Fundamentally, who is about name. But it's not simply, I mean, obviously I can give the chair, I can call the chair Matthew, it doesn't <laughs> make it a who, right? So, that's, so what, what makes finally human beings who's, um, uh, for me, uh, in terms of my theology, is that God calls us in Jesus, as Jesus, to be in communion with the divine who's. And so it's, a, so it's, a, it's a that point that our, that our it's that, it's that's, what it, that's when we understand fully what it means to be a human being and to be a who. Now does that mean, a human who, let's imagine, divine who's. let's imagine a world in which there were no names, we didn't have names, would there still be who's? Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out what would that, because uh, to be, a, to be uh, for me to be a who is precisely to be called by name, and obviously what one makes, you know, how we could, could there be nonverbal names, right? But uh, let's just say there were no names. There was no, uh, there was no identification of what it was. Yeah. Well, in that case, I don't. I mean, I'm not. I'm. Uh, I, I think then you're saying, yeah, there, and you're, 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 that would be the, to define it as being there would be no who's. <laughs> That's interesting. But the the key point I want to I want to get out with the incarnation just to get is that um, is that, and I think this is one thing that Christians have not always been good on is that there's no. Christ's divinity is not some modification of his humanity. It's not because he's got more faith than anyone else. He may have, but I don't know. It's certainly not because he's taller or faster or because he knows everything or anything like that. Uh, there's, no, there's no, again, there's no scale. Jesus has whatever human characteristics God uh, he has, which are particular to him, some of which may be much better than mine, some of which may not be so good. Um, that isn't what defines who he is. Uh, what defines who he is is his identity, and his identity is is precisely as the second person of the Trinity. That's who he is, uh, okay. which is not who I am. No. Then I want to talk um, to you about the third person of the Trinity. Sure. So we're talking about God as the ineffable creator and originator of everything. We're talking about um, Jesus. Let's talk about. Well, Jesus is the ineffable. I mean, there, there, there's only one. Only one, the three persons are all equally creator. Yeah. Yeah. So. So there's one formulation of, of God, which is the person of Jesus. So who and what is the Holy Spirit in Christian theology? Why, why add this additional um, part of the Trinity? What, okay. what does okay. that bring to okay. the table? First of all, they're just technically right. There are no parts to the Trinity. Um, the persons aren't parts. Um, and they're not added. Um, uh, I mean, I, I mean I say historically, the, the, the divinity of the Spirit was the last to be sort of nailed down. So I take the point. I just want to make benefits look here. So let's back up. What is the Trinity? The Trinity is the way in which Christians can claim or seek to claim that they are monotheists and 
confess what they say about Jesus as the Savior. Okay. So that's the Trinity is simply a way of try, trying to think through uh, what, what does it imply about God if we confess that Jesus is the one who saves. And what they, what Christians have came up with, um, and you know, you, and it's, it's formulated officially in the fourth century, but you can see bits of it before then, um, is that to, to talk about God, one has to talk about the one Jesus called Father, one has to talk about Jesus, and one has to talk about the Spirit. Um, partly because in order to talk about Jesus, you've got to talk about, you've got to have those three names in play. Okay. Um, so why do Christians talk about the Holy Spirit? Um, because uh, Jesus talks about the Spirit, and those who talk about Jesus early on talk about the Spirit as being the Spirit of God, and also the, the, Spirit, the, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, and the Spirit of the Son. So there are those, that, that, those locutions are all found in Scripture. So somehow, Spirit is intimately bound up with the work of God in Jesus. And so that's why, that's why Spirit language is there. Um, now, uh, in terms of how does one think about, you know, how does one talk about the Trinity in ways that are consistent with what Christians claim about the equal divinity of the three, because clearly Father and Son are terms defined, are relatively defined terms, whereas spirit is not quite so, you know, father is defined in terms of progeny, son in terms of father, that, that's pretty clear. Spirit seems more sort of peripheral, and this has been a, particularly in the last 30, 40 years, a classic uh, sort of issue in Western theology in particular is, you know, where's the spirit? Is the spirit depersonalized? Is it not there? Da, 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 da. Um, my own, I mean, sort of the way I talk through it is, uh, the Father, I mean, the, fa the Father is the Father in giving the entirety of the Father's being to the Son. And that happens in the Spirit. And the Son receives the fullness of the Father's being, that is the fullness of divinity, uh, and in so doing acknowledges and glorifies the Father also in the Spirit. When you say in the spirit, what does that mean? Yeah, I, I'm is not quite sure. What, I'm not sure. Yeah, in or by, but I mean, I don't know. What, what does it mean? I don't know. The spirit, <laughs> the spirit is the one. I mean, you know, the classic way of talking about this in the West is the spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. I think. I mean, I think that does get into sort of. I mean, again, it's impersonal. But I, I think think of the spirit as the witness to the love of the Father and the Son. Is how I would want to do it. But there is a there is a God as I mean. The, the life of God is the mutual interpenetrating relationship of these three, which none, neither of, none of which have any separable or separate existence, right? So um, uh, there is God, as it were, so it's God repeated three times. God in the mode of donation, the Father, God in the mode of reception. So divinity isn't simply some sort of a static monad, but some sort of a interrelated dynamism, and God in the mode of witness of gift and, and celebration of gift and reception. But those are all coincident. It's not like three people sitting around the table, notwithstanding Rublev's famous icon, which is beautiful and I like it, but uh, it's not, it's, you know, not tritheism. Christians always want to avoid that. Uh, but the spirit, um, uh, I mean, the, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, well, I think, I mean, my sense of the spirit, precisely because the spirit is always defined in scripture by reference to one of the other two persons, uh, is as the one who is, again, sort of the, the witness of the communion of the, of the Father and the Son. So in terms of... Um, but that's a, that, that really is a pretty, that's a metaphor I would throw out as being, as, I think, no worse than any other, but uh, not particularly, you know, a very limited use. So. Well, in terms of like the everyday life of Christians, mm. it makes sense that they can conceive of God clearly and that they conceive of Jesus clearly as a human. What, practically speaking, is the Holy Spirit? Is it something that, because that, I know in like Pentecostal faith, there's a, there's a idea that like you can feel the Holy Spirit or it can like you have, you're in some state of mind that is, that is the Holy Spirit. It is, can, you try to, can you explain what that phenomena is? Like, is there a actual 
concrete relationship between that spirit and regular old human beings? Yeah, I mean, well, I think, I mean, I would say the spirit is, I mean, as you know, Paul famously says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, right? And, uh, and when John in, well, John in 1 John says, test the spirits, it's about, you test the spirit by saying, do they believe Jesus come in the flesh? They did, it's the spirit, it's not, it's a, it's a bad spirit. Hmm. Um, the spirit is whatever uh, in human life uh, generates um, faithful relationship with the God of Jesus Christ, who is also the God of Israel. Hmm. Um, now, to what extent does that manifest itself in ecstatic experiences? For some people it does. Uh, I mean, they say it does, and I certainly see plenty of people who do that for whom I'm convinced that their witness is a faithful witness. It's not, it's not a way that the Spirit moves in my life. Of course, I also people who see people who have ecstatic experiences uh, and name it in the Spirit who do things that I don't think are very witness to Jesus. I wouldn't say that's the Holy Spirit at work. Of course, there are people who are you know very doer and, and proper and don't have any exact experiences who also claim the spirit and they can do bad and good as well. So I think the spirit is uh, the spirit is active wherever people are acting in faith because it is a fundamental Christian conviction I think that uh, all that we do in faith is always by the gift of God, which is which the spirit which 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 is mediated to us through the spirit, and so the spirit is always the agent by whom that happens or through whom that happens. Um, uh, is there any particular, so how, to what extent does one feel it? Um, you know, I think that's, people talk about their faith in different ways, and I, I don't have any, it's not, that's not my natural idiom, um, but it doesn't seem to be an illegitimate idiom. So when you say they're acting in faith, what does that mean, the, the faith part? Does that mean when you're acting with the belief in this uh, other worldview, does that mean you're acting out of love? What does that it mean? Means you're, it means whatever you're doing, uh, you're doing it in a way that bears, that intentionally, I mean, has, to be faith, it has to be somehow thematized, um, not necessarily in terms of a precise doctrinal form, but some sense is what you're doing, uh, as you're doing it in and as your witness to the good news of Jesus. And, uh, you, and in fact, you're not simply thinking that, but it actually is the good news of Jesus, because of course people can do things thinking it's, it's bearing good witness, where in fact they're not. So, uh, and this is why spirits have to be tested, because simply, you know, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, and so on and so forth. Uh, but where the spirit is active, that's what's happening. And I think the spirit's witness um, at, you know, is often quite compelling and, and uh, visible, but even where one thinks of, I think of the witness as being compelling and visible, for example, Martin Luther King say in his, in his more heroic moments, plenty of people at the time thought it was crazy or demonic or just, you know, born out of uh, all kinds, you know, negative things. And other times people think they're doing, you know, a lot of devout Christians, people who claim to be devout Christians, and I think honestly believe themselves to be, thought Hitler was divine revelation, which I don't think was the case. So it's not as, it certainly can't be reduced to one subjective feeling. There has to be discernment. And I think that's part of what the church is about. Uh, the church is, at best, a community of mutual accountability that, um, uh, that tests people's claims to be speaking by the Spirit uh, or acting in the Spirit, that is, to be acting uh, or speaking faithfully uh, and to have a community to which one is accountable and in conversation with which one attempts to discern what should we be saying, what should we be doing, is an important part of, I think, uh, what Christians are about. So the Spirit is active in that process as well, I would say. So kind of colloquially, I've heard a lot of people say that um, everybody has a conscience and they say what that is, is the Spirit. They say there's this, there's this relationship between you know, people's conscience and God and that is the Holy Spirit. Do you think there's, is that fair or do you think that's in I think everybody has a conscience. I wouldn't identify with the conscience with the Spirit. I think people in good conscience can do horrible things. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, I'm, for example, I wouldn't want to claim that Hitler had a bad conscience. I think he honestly thought Jews were insects, but that's just wrong. So your con and this is part of my view of sort of <laughs> sin and the fall, is I don't, I think, yes, people have a conscience. Um, and I'm not saying God can speak through the conscience, but that's, that certainly can happen. But the, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't identify the conscience insofar as it is precisely a human, a characteristic of human nature with the spirit, which is precisely not a characteristic of human nature, but a gift that supervenes on it. I see. Well, on that note, I don't, I don't want to take any more of your time, but I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right, that was my interview with Dr. Ian McFarlane. I hope you guys liked it. 
There's a lot more where that came from. And as this show progresses, I intend to have a lot more interviews, including thinkers from every faith. As I said at the beginning of this episode, I treat all of these propositions just as philosophic claims, which means I have lots of thoughts. I have lots of analysis eventually. I'll make sure to do an interview breakdown because I think there's a lot of interesting ideas from this interview. So if you like this work, if you're enjoying this series, then you can help support the show just by contributing one or two dollars whenever a new episode is posted. Go to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson and you can join the more than 50 people right now who are patrons. And by signing up, you'll get a free copy of my book, What's the Big Deal About Bitcoin? In addition to my upcoming book, Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge. So thanks for supporting, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.